Okay, continuing on with the universe as symbols and signs, an essay on mysticism in the Eastern Church. We are in chapter 6, entitled Animals as Sibyls, Symbols. The dove is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit appeared in the form of a dove when Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. Quote, Lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. End quote. In the tradition of the church, it is recorded that the Spirit of God appeared to several holy men in the form of a dove. The dove is harmless and guileless, tame and endearing. The serpent is a symbol of the devil. It was used as a tool by Satan when he deceived, deceived Eve, inducing her to commit the sin of disobedience toward the Creator. The serpent, therefore, is the only animal in the world that was cursed by God. Quote, because thou hast done this, be thou cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. End quote. From here comes a terrible enmity, which still exists not only between man and the serpent, but between all animals and the serpent. When Jesus advised his disciples, be ye wise as serpents and harmless as doves, he was thinking of the serpent's constant watchfulness and awareness of danger. Yet that is only part of his advice to his disciples. The other part is harmless as doves. St. Christophsimum comments, quote, Wisdom is of no avail unless connected with harmlessness, end quote. Isidore Pilusrat explains with these words, quote, To keep the faith as a serpent keeps its head from danger and disrobe the old man as a serpent disrobes its old scales, end quote. Vipers, very fierce and poisonous, symbolize the devil and all those who do the will of the devil. John the Baptist called the Pharisees a generation of vipers. And the Lord himself repeated these words. The Lord said to the face of the leaders of the Pharisees, Ye are, a quote, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do, end quote. A lamb is a symbol of Christ. St. John the Baptist, looking up on Jesus, exclaimed, Behold the Lamb of God. And another John saw in this apocalyptic visions Christ on the throne of heavenly glory as a lamb. Sheep signify the faithful followers of Christ, and the wolves the unfaithful and pagan. Quote, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, said Jesus. And again, behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. End quote. Dogs and swine are symbol of the stubborn and impure unbelievers. Dogs especially signify the adulterers and swine the gluttons. Therefore the Savior said, quote, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast pearls before spine. End quote. Just as a hen with motherly care gathers her chick chickens, feeds them, and warms them, even so the loving Lord tends his faithful. O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, he reproached, the faithless city, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. End quote. So then, in this sense, the hen is the symbol of Christ, and the chicken is a symbol of his true followers. The horse is a symbol of a faithful and obedient servant. St. Dionysus the Aeropagate says that the horse signifies obedience. In the, service, in the service book of the Greek church, the apostles are called the swift horses because they swiftly and faithfully spread all over the world the glad news of salvation. A man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle are the four symbolic animals seen as standing under the throne of the Almighty by Ezekiel and John the Divine in their transcendent visions. According to some of the sacred commandments, our commentators, those four animals symbolize the four fundamental virtues, wisdom, courage, justice, and purity. Accepting this interpretation, others add that those four animals also represent the different spiritual powers in heaven around the throne, who are day and night praising the Lord God. From ancient times, however, the painters of the four evangelists, evangelists used to paint each one of them with one of the four symbolic animals, to wit, Matthew with the figure of a man, Mark with a lion, Luke with an ox, and John with an eagle. The meaning is, the incarnated Christ is the real consummator of all symbolic powers and virtues. Frogs, flies, and lice, which God struck the land with the pharaoh, of the pharaohs, are symbolic of men's sins, either by words or deeds. Invisible microbes and bacteria are symbols of men's invisible sins, i.e. in thoughts and evil desires. Unless a man quickly cleanses his soul of evil thoughts and desires in the very beginning, they will multiply like microbes do in a body and strike the soul with incurable disease. Wild beasts generally are symbols of wild human passions. Just as wild beasts tear human bodies, even so passions tear human souls. 
The creator gave Adam power over all passions. Therefore, he had the power over all the wild beasts as symbols of passions. The holy men and women who succeeded through new Adam, Jesus Christ, to gain the power over their own passions, gained therewith also the power over the wild beasts of the field and forest. Chapter 7, Recognition of Truth When the creator of the world created our first ancestors, he said to them, quote, Have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. End quote. The psalmist, paraphrasing this commandment of God, said, O Lord, or, or Lord, or Lord, O Lord, our Lord, thou, midst, thou madest him to have dominion over the, the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the seas. What does this all mean? Certainly not to conquer nature in the modern sense, namely to exploit it, and at the same time to worship it. To exploit it, but alas, not for spiritual enlightenment, but only for material and utilitarian aims, and worship it as the only existing God, which is practically means to, con to be conquered by nature. No, the cited words have quite different meaning. Essentially, they mean, O oh man, have dominion over, these, over all these symbols, and allow not them to have dominion over thee. Or, let, O oh man, all things be to thee as a, re as, a, as a red book of pictures, and thou ascend with thy spirit to the realm of spiritual realities, represented symbolically in the pictorial book of nature. All is under the feet of the divine spirit, but thou alone art at the feet of thy creator. God emphatically forbade man to make gods not only of men's work, but of his own too. There was and there is no civilization so great as this vast and starry universe, the civilization of God. Yet the maker of the universe feels offended when man, when men adore his works, and much more so when they, when they in their vainglory, adore their own little break, breakable toys, the works of their hands. When we look at the sun and the stars, what is need, indeed man or, or the son of man? Yet man is dearer to God than all this world on the condition that he worships the one true God and that he knows the high value and dignity of his own soul. Therefore, every literal reading of nature leads finally to idolatry. And all idolatry separates man from spiritual realities, from God, in the first place. God is spirit, and they, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It was from John chapter 4. To an idol worshiper, as well as to a materialist philosopher, nature may be likened unto Chinese letters. What an impression! What impression! What an impression! Would Chinese writings make on a foreigner ignorant of reading Chinese? The same as that made by embroiderers or ornament ornament ornamentics, or of a mysterious scrabblings without sense and meaning. Not so with the learned Chinese. He would not fasten his attention upon the letters, but he would seek the sense and the meaning of what was written study the message veiled in the composition of those letters. So the same letters may be, for one, a pillar of smoke, and for the other, a pillar of light. This is the true picture of idol worshippers, of both the scientific and the unscientific on one side, and the enlightened Christians on the other. The first cleave, the first cleave with their senses and spirits to the symbols of nature, and the other, others see with their senses the symbols of but with their spirit, they read in the spirit, i.e. the spiritual message in the symbols. Chapter 8. Places, things, tools, and constructions as symbols. The threshing floor, fan, and granary also have their symbolic meaning. The threshing floor is a symbol of the world. The fan is a symbol of God's judgment. The granary is a symbol of the kingdom of heaven. The righteous will be gathered into heaven as pure wheat is gathered into the granary, and sinners, like the chaff, separated from the wheat, will be thrown into the unquenchable fire. A city on the hill is a symbol of those same men who are called salt and light. Verily, as a city set upon a mount cannot be hidden, so the true followers of Christ cannot be hidden from the view either of angels or of men. Candles, quote, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. End quote. The candle is a symbol of a man enlightened by God's Spirit. 
It would be considered foolishness if anybody would light this candle in darkness and put it under a bushel. Yet such foolishness has been often done to men and of God, whose light the envious and the stupid tried to hide, covering up with covering them with with slandering. But there is no foolishness in God. Sooner or later, God puts his living candles rejected by the world on a high candlestick, higher than time and space, and there they give light to all those who are in God's house. Think of the apostles, saints, and martyrs. A, a, closest, a, a closet is an innermost room in the house in which a treasure is often hidden. It is the symbol of the heart of man. Speaking of prayer, the Lord said, quote, When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. End quote. There in secret you should pray to him who only is able to help you, and not as the hypocrites who pray in the streets before the eyes of onlookers, which is offensive to the Almighty. Shutting the door is a symbol of separating oneself from the outer world and its sensations and communicating with the Father alone. The door is a symbol of Christ, according to his own words, quote, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, end quote. Beside him, there is no other entrance to the kingdom of heaven. Also, when he speaks of the straight gate, he means himself. The way is a symbol of Christ, of course, the right way. Did not he say of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life? A house built upon a rock is a symbol of the Christian church, which is built upon faith in the Son of God. It signifies also the right and healthy education of youth grounded upon his teachings. A house built upon the sand on the other hand, signifies every other spiritual or moral education built upon the foundation contrary to Christ. It must fail and fall. Bottles of wine, new bottles and new wine are symbol symbols of new men, the new covenant. Through Christ, men change and become new. As new wine can only be kept in the new bottles, so can the new covenant be kept only in new men. Like a strong light, the doctrine of the new covenant may be too strong and may blind a set of old and feeble eyes. So too strong a vintage may be altogether too strong of a wine for an old and feeble soul. New piece of cloth and an old garment. No, quote, no man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. End quote from Matthew 9, 16. That is to say, a wise man does not, but an ignorant, but an ignorant man may. This action symbolizes the usual unchristian method of correcting a bad man by making superficial corrections or reforming an old sinner merely by reading him a new lecture on morals or giving a morsel of bread to the prodigal son instead of turning him back to his father's house. By these palliative remedies, yea, by this mending of a big old evil with a little piece of something new, one makes the evil worse. This is also the reproach to all superficial attempts to correct human society by mending it piecemeal instead of by fundamentally and through renewal through Christ. A yoke is a symbol of misery generally and of servitude especially. There are two of the wor there are two of the worst kinds of servitude, that of living under a godless tyranny and that of being ruled by personal passions, ignorance and vice. Instead of a heavy earthly yoke, Christ proposes for men his own yoke. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, he says. What wonderful words! The legendary Hercules took the earth upon his shoulders and succumbed under his, its weight. Jesus took upon himself all the sins of mankind, a much heavier burden, and still he called it easy and light. Indeed, a true God as against a legendary one. Christ's yoke was easy and his burden is light, is a light one because of his love which always makes everything easy and light. He is a loving servant of his loving Father. The cross is a symbol of Christ. It is a symbol of Christianity too. It is the banner of the Christian church. It is also a symbol of salvation. It means both death and victory. Quote, the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved is the power of God, said Paul. There were three crucifixes on Golgotha, that of the innocent one, that of the pen the penitent thief, and that of the impenitent thief, malefactor. The pen penitent thief 
took his cross as he had deserved and followed Christ in the very last moment of his life, he thereby became worthy of him. The impenitent malefactor not only considered his own suffering as undeserved, but mocked him who suffered innocently. There are only three crosses. The fourth is not to be. The cup and platter are symbols of both pure and impure man. It is more important to wash a cup and a platter inside rather than outside. Just so, purity of soul is more important than cleanliness of body, though both are necessary. Jesus said, quote, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. End quote. When he says cleanse first, he thereby gives prevalence to the soul over the body and puts, as is usual in the gospel, the care of the body in second place. Whitened and beautifully decorated sepulchers are the symbols of the hypocrites. I don't know that word. S-E-P-U-L-C-H-E-R-S. In vain are the sepulchers, sepulchers outwardly decorated while they are within, full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanliness. The bones signify the petrified hearts of men who are shut to the influence of the Holy Spirit. All, unclean, all uncleanness inside this sepulcher is signified by the foul-smelling human vices and passions which the hypocrites are masking by their external good behavior. Purses are symbols of our inner closet filled with heavy, heavenly jewelry, i.e. with good works. The same meaning has the treasury, quote, providence, provide yourself bags, i.e. purses, which was which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that fall, faileth not, end quote. The girding of the lions represent abstinence and self-control and burning candles, the mind enlightened by Christ. The mansions on earth are the symbols of the heavenly mansion. Quote, in my father's house are many mansions. The temple as the building symbolizes the human body. Ye know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you. A rod is a symbol of authority, but a rod may also be a symbol of God or God's angel supporting a man in his infirmities. The sword is a symbol of God's word. The seed, too, is a symbol of God's word, but the seed means the revealed words of God to the world, whereas the sword means the highest. Quote, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, says the seer of mysteries. And St. Paul says, quote, and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, end quote. The shield is a symbol of faith, quote, above all, take the shield of faith, end quote. Indeed, the faith in Christ is the greatest protection against all temptations of the world. It is also the very root of all the virtues and of love above all. Darts and arrows are symbols of the temptations, both of this world and those of the ancient deceiver, the spirit of darkness. These evil spirits strike human souls with evil thoughts, just as a heart is struck by a hunter's dart. The apostle therefore commands the faithful to be watchful with patience and prayer in order to be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Okay, that will bring us to chapter 9. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit tired here, so I'm going to stop. Uh, I've been reading a lot out loud, so thanks for listening.